This is the final tutorial in the series on using R and R Studio. So congratulations, you made it this far. And this is the last tutorial that we'll watch. And this is probably the most rewarding because we're getting into a package called ggplot, which is this beloved package for producing beautiful graphics. I'm going to continue working in the R project that I created last week. So I'm going to open it up by navigating to the folder and selecting the uh, starting with data project. And then I'm going to open up the R script uh, working with data. Actually, no, I'll create a new R script and I'll save this in the project folder starting with data. But this R script I will call, uh, let's just, I'll call it ggplot. And you want to work in the R project folder from last week because we want to access the same data. The survey is complete. The first thing we want to do is load the Tidyverse library, Tidyverse library. If you haven't installed it yet, remember you'll need to use the install.packages Tidyverse. I'm not going to run that line. And we want to load our data into an object called surveys underscore complete. Instead of read dot csv will use the tidyverse version called read underscore csv and remember the first argument is the file so it's in our data folder and it's called surveys complete csv and i'll go ahead and use the keyboard shortcut to run that command the tidyverse when we use this function instead of read.csv, the underscore CSV, it loads the data in a tibble, which is very similar to a data frame, but has some unique properties. ggplot2 is a plotting package that makes it fairly simple to create complex and beautiful plots from data in a data frame or a tibble. And we only need, if we want to change something about the plot, we only have to uh, change a particular aspect of our code. And this helps in creating those publication quality plots with just a few adjustments. The format of ggplot um, takes the function of, of this. So it starts with the ggplot function and it expects some data and it expects an argument called mapping where you'll include the aesthetics like, like x, what, what, what do you want on the x axis, what do you want on the y axis. You, can also, what do you want the colors to be grouped by? And it expects some sort of geometry. So that could be a point if you're interested in a scatter plot. That could be a box plot. Uh, it could be a histogram. And we'll see a few examples of those geometries. So this is the basic formula that we can expect when building our ggplots. So let's start with calling the ggplot function for our data surveys complete. Go ahead and run that and when you do you'll notice that this gray box appears but nothing actually appears. There's no plot within this um, 
within this window. And that's because we didn't specify our X and Y axis and what kind of geometry we we'll want the data to be represented by, like a point or a box plot. So now let's fill in that mapping and give it some aesthetics. Uh, X equals weight and Y equals, let's put hind foot length. So now we have the data and we're specifying the X, Y. If you want to, let's view the survey's complete data to remind ourselves the data that we're working with. Remember, these are small mammal trap data and uh, each row is a single observation, so a single small mammal that was trapped and for which hind foot length, weight, and the observation, other observation information was recorded. So let's go ahead and run this line where we've provided the X and Y axes. So in this, this time the axes appear, but there's the data does not. And that's because we didn't provide a geometry. So let's add, and I might clean this up a little bit. Um, I'll do a hard return here. And I've got this plus sign here. The plus is really important because it allows you to modify uh, existing ggplot objects. This means you can easily set up templates and explore different types of plots. Let's build in our first geometry. Let's say we want a, a point a scatter plot, so we want to use the geom point. So I'll go ahead and run this. And now our data appears in the window. So now we've added the points using the geom point. Uh, let's say we wanted a, another geometry. Instead of having to start from scratch, all we'd have to do is change the, the geometry. So instead of a geom point, we could use something like uh, geom box plot. So let's see an ex just a, a quick example of how changing the box plot would change the output. All right, so let's go back to the point and see another feature of ggplot, which is modifying the aesthetics. A key feature of ggplot is that plots are built iteratively. And what that means is you add different features uh, consecutively. So we've defined the data set we want to use. We've laid out the axes and we've chosen a geometry. Then we can start modifying this plot to extract more information from it. For instance, we can add transparency using alpha. So I'll give this a transparency of 10%. And it takes a minute to plot because it's uh, a large data set with 30,000 observations. So you can compare this, the the data points now have uh, are slightly transparent, and you can compare this to the previous plot where they're they're not transparent at all. We can also add colors for all the points inside the geometry. Let's give the all the points a blue color. So now all the all these points appear blue. 
We can also color each point by species. So ggplot will provide a different color corresponding to different values in a vector. So instead of designating the color of all plots should be blue, now let's give it aesthetics where the color is equal to species ID and species ID is a column in our data frame. So I'll run this and then we'll end up with the points uh, filled with different colors for the different species. So maybe the different species have a different relationship between hind foot length and weight. And coloring by species allows us to detect that. Let's see an example of a box plot. Sometimes these are good for summarizing your data. Let's use the same ggplot arguments. So we want to work with our surveys complete. We want to use weight. Um, but instead of weight on the x-axis, let's look at species ID at the x-axis and weight on the y-axis. So now we're interested in weight by species. And we need to provide a geometry. So let's look at a box plot. And now we have on the x-axis species ID and on the y-axis weight. So we're able to distinguish weight by species for each individual species. And this might be something you want to do with your NEON data. Let's add points to the box plot. This allows us to get a better idea of the number of measurements and their distribution. We don't know the disadvantage of using box plots is you don't know how many points these boxes represent. Maybe there's only four points here, but there's a thousand points here. So we can add, let's first add our box plots to be Uh, alpha equals zero, and then add something called jitter, which moves all of the points slightly so that they minimize the degree of overlap. And let's give those points a transparency of 30% or 0.3, and let's give them the color tomato. ggplot recognizes basic colors like red, blue, green, yellow, even things like light gray, light gray. And it also has some unique uh, color names. You can look that up by Googling ggplot color names. Now let's go ahead and run this now. And now we'll see uh, instead of a box plot, we'll see points overlaid on top of that box plot and they're adjusted slightly so that they don't overlap. In fact, if I zoomed on this, it might be a little bit easier to view. Why it's so big. There we go. So you can see the jitter aligns these plots um, aligns the points in a way where you can get an idea of the number of observations and their distribution across the box plot. So the box plot represents the mean and I think these are the standard one standard deviation and these are the 95% confidence intervals represented by the lines. It's important to note that the order of your arguments here, the order of these functions here, are the order in which they're plotted. So if I wanted the geom, the box plot to appear on top of the points, I would have to move that below. So this is plotted first, and then this is plotted on top of that. 
And that's important to note, especially if you want a very specific output. So now the box plot is plotted on top of the geometry because the jitter geometry was was comes first, came first, followed by the box plot geometry. Let's see an example of a time series data because if you're working with neon data, you might want to map something over time. So let's calculate the number of counts per year for each genus. First, we need to group the data and count records within each group. So let's use an object called yearly counts. And from surveys complete, I'm going to use that pipe that we learned about. So take surveys complete, then count the number of years for each genus. Let's go ahead and run this. And now we have this object called yearly counts where we have for each year the number of individuals from each genus. And if I wanted to sort by genus, you could see that if multiple, if the same genus was caught multiple years, we have the count broken out by year and genus. Now let's take this newly created object, yearly counts, and plot it. So we went our ggplot data equals yearly counts. I'm using those auto tab complete to minimize my typing. We need to provide aesthetics. So on the x-axis, we're interested in year. And on the y-axis, we're interested in count. And if you don't remember what that variable name is, for this count function, R automatically assigns an end to the column name. And if we run that, oh, nothing appears. It's because I didn't provide a geometry. So in this case, let's look at a line. So the line appears, but it's not exactly what we want because we're plotting the data for all genre together, all genera together. And what we need to do is tell ggplot to draw a line for each individual genus by modifying the aesthetic function to include group. So in this aesthetics, we want to group equals genus. And genus was the column name in our yearly counts. So now it'll draw a line for each group. Let's go ahead and run this. And we'll see individual lines for each genus. In this plot, we see, okay, there's different lines, different genera, but we don't know which one is which. So instead of grouping by the genus, we can use color inside of the aesthetics. When you use color inside of the aesthetics, R understands whatever you tell the color to be a group or category. So let's see an example of this. And it looks like it didn't complete because there's this plus sign and not the Pac-Man sign. And that's because I didn't run the entire command. So now the ggplot is grouping by genus. We can see the different genera here and we can see there just the lines are distinguished by color. A useful feature of ggplot is that you can integrate the pipe operator with ggplot. So above, we had to use you know, several um, lines here, then designate the data. 
But remember, pipes are great when you're taking data from an earlier output as the input for this line. Let's see an example. We could call yearly counts, take yearly counts, then use the pipe to map it into a ggplot function. And our, we still need to provide the aesthetics, but when we use the pipe, R understands that the data argument is filled by the previous line. So you see, we don't have to provide data equals yearly counts because R understands that the input is, is this object here. And we still need to supply a geometry going to run this and it works similarly and it's a the benefit of using pipes with ggplot is that it's a little more efficient and your code is a little more tidy the pipe operator can also be used to link this date this kind of data manipulation with your data visualization. So instead of you know these this data manipulation step occurring outside of our ggplot, we could combine these. Let's store this as an object called yearly counts graph. And let's start by taking our surveys complete data, then count by year and genus, then ggplot using these aesthetics. I'm going to copy and paste the rest here. Clean that up a little bit. Then ggplot using these aesthetics and plot this using a line. All right. So I'm going to run this, and it won't run because we've stored the output as an object. So if I wanted to run, I would need to call the name of that object. And now it prints out. So we can compare these lines of code here to the combination of, I'll expand this a little bit, to these up here. So see how this consolidated chunk of code is a little more concise than doing this step separately. And when you have you know, tens and hundreds of lines of code, you wanna do everything possible to keep your code neat and tidy and as concise and efficient as possible. ggplot has another useful feature called faceting. Maybe for our plot, maybe we had lots of genera making it difficult to distinguish one genus from another. So instead of plotting all the lines in a single plot, we want to make separate plots for each line. And we can do that using faceting. It allows us to split one plot into multiple plots based on a factor included in the data set. And in this example, we'll use the factor of genus. So let's do another call ggplot. We want data equals yearly counts, and we need to provide aesthetics, x equals year and y equals n, similar to what we have in the viewer. And we want a geom line similar to what we have displayed. And now we want to add a facet wrap. And our facets, it takes an argument called facets equals the variables uh, of genus. So let's run this vars genus function. We might have to tell it that it's inside the yearly counts. And um, 
we can question mark vars if you're curious about uh, what that function does and it selects particular variables. So in this example, it's selecting variables in the genus column. So let's go ahead and run this and navigate back to the plots page. And now what we're seeing is each genus plotted um, in its own separate plot. Now let's say we're interested in uh, maybe the sex of each individual within each of these plots. So uh, we're adding another layer of complexity. To do that, we would need to make counts in the data frame grouped by year, genus, and sex because these plots were only grouped by year and genus. So let's use Let's use this format here. I'm going to paste it here and I'm not going to modify it. So I want to call this something else, maybe yearly sex graph. And I want to take our surveys complete. And in, in addition to year and genus, I want to add sex. And then I want to plot this in a similar way y x equals year y equals n color equals sex now and i want to add a geom line and then i need to add the facet so that each genus is separate is plotted separately so i'm going to ha have a plot like this but instead the lines there will be two lines for the different sexes and it didn't print out because I stored it in an object. So I need to call that object in order for it to print. So I'm going to try to zoom this. And we can see now there's two sex, female and male individuals that were captured. And now there's two lines per plot. So doing this in something like Excel would be really difficult. It would take a lot of time. And you can see that it takes one, two, three, four, five lines of code to do this in R. So well, pretty handy. If we wanted to break out male and female, we could also uh, do that by modifying the facet wrap. So I'm going to copy and paste this and then modify it. So instead of facet wrap, we would want to use a facet grid because this allows two facets. So rows, let's say, are our sex um, variable and columns equals our genus variable. Let's go ahead and run that. And I'm getting an error. Could not find function f -f facet grid because there's two Fs. I made a typo. And I stored it in the same object name. Didn't catch that. So now, if we look at this, we see the rows. The rows are the different sexes. And the columns are the different genera. So that's pretty cool. You can also organize the panels only by rows. So maybe we didn't want the this argument here. Let's see how that would change and how I'm going to remove this so that it automatically prints out and I don't have to run the object name. Right, so now we have only rows uh, to distinguish the sex variable. But that's not very useful. Um, let's use the variable genus so that all our plots are on a single uh, different rows for the different genera. And you can, we can look at instead of rows, we can have 
columns using the calls. Maybe there's too many rows here, makes it difficult to display. So now maybe you want something like this, where the genera are organized by columns. Right, so they're stacked by in columns and not um, flipped on one axis as rows. That makes it a little bit easier to visualize. You'll notice that ggplot automatically builds in these kind of axes, these minor axes lines, and uh, scientific journals, as well as design theory, uh, argues that you should eliminate anything that is absolutely not necessary for conveying your information. So we can use different, ggplot has different themes, uh, called by the theme function so you can see all the different options i like theme classic oopsie forgot to use autocomplete theme classic let's run that and you can see that it removes those minor axis lines and the color background as well and you can try different themes uh, like theme black and white or theme minimal so it removes the boxes around each plot but I I prefer theme classic as it removes all the unnecessary information Because ggplot works iter iteratively by this addition sign, right, adding different elements, faceting, themes, it allows you to customize your plot in as many ways as you can think of. So let's change the names of axes to something more informative than year and n and add a title to the figure. So I'm going to copy and paste this. I'm going to add something like customization. So let's customize our plot by adding labels using this label function, labs. And I'll give it a title equals observed genera through time, comma. So it takes additional arguments like x for x-axis, year of observation, comma, another argument, it understands y for y-axis, number of individuals. And I'll keep my classic theme. You can play around with others. And now we've added the title, the x label, and the y label. So the axes have more informative names, but their readability can be improved by increasing the font size using the theme function. The theme function understands a, a large list of arguments, one of which is the size of the text using element text equals, this could be uh, different arguments. So here we want to give it a size of 16. And now our axes on all of our text, we can compare this, has increased in size. You can also change the font of the plots. You can change, if I zoom this here, you can change the direction of these axis labels, the tick marks, you can have them displayed uh, vertically so that they don't overlap with each other. And you can italicize maybe the genus names. So let's see an example of building on our ggplot using uh, our theme 
So instead, I'm going to modify our theme function. In this, I'm going to write axis text for the x axis. We need to call element text. I want the color equals gray 20. I want the size equals 12. I want the angle equals 90. And I want to adjust horizontally and vertically the position of these text marks, these axis tick marks. Then I want to modify the axis text, axis dot text on the y axis. And I need to modify it using this element text function, which recognizes the different colors. So I want the same color, gray 20. I want the same size, 12. And I want to use strip.text equals, I want to get modify it using the element text function and I want to call italic and I want the axis labels text equals element text size equals 16. Oh, phew. Okay, that's quite the ggplot and I might fix these up a little bit how could I modify this so that it's a little nicer to read or you can also I think it's code reformat code and so it formats it in a way that makes it easier to read so I'm going to run this and we can see how those modifications played out so here are the, how we modified the position of the axis.text.x. So this was the angle equals 90 and the h just and v just equals 0 0.5. And the gray, notice how the tick Axis tick mark labels are in this gray color. And then we modified the size of the X and Y axis labels using the element text size equals 16. So these kinds of modifications allow you to, to customize um, your plot with very specific uh, directions. But if this is something you're repeating over and over, then you might want to store these modifications as an object. So let's see an example of that. Let's take out this entire theme block of text and delete this and store it as an object called gray theme and I'm going to paste this those theme specifications I'm going to run this so now if I built my plot I'm going to copy and paste it below instead of adding all those theme specifications I could call gray theme and it stores all those specifications and let's say I was interested instead of a geom line maybe I wanted a geom box plot and you can see oops not what I expected because I've got this grouping by color sex. So I'm going to remove that. And year N 
maybe I instead of this grouping, I want to work with the survey's complete data, geom box. My labels will be observations through time. And maybe on the x-axis, I want species ID. And on the y, I want hind foot length. So I'm really changing up this ggplot. But it's going to have the same theme specifications by calling this gray theme. So I went roundabout to build this ggplot. So we started with our surveys complete with our original data set. Then we piped it into our ggplot function and we specified the X and Y aesthetics. We didn't have to call the data because we piped it in using the pipes. And we called the geometry, geom box plot, and we called the theme specifications. So now we have the theme for a very different kind of plot. So it preserves the theme for other kinds of plots that you wanted to build. Oftentimes you'll want to you'll want to arrange plots on the same page. And to do this, there's a package called Patchwork that's very useful for arranging plots on the same page. So go ahead and install that package if you haven't um, used it before. And I believe I don't know if install.package couldn't find function. There should be an S in there. That's why tab complete is so useful. So I'll go ahead and install the package. And it might take a minute. And then I'm going to call that package using the library. Remember, you only have to install packages once, and then in future sessions, you can call the package using the library function without reinstalling it. So let's build two plots. Let's We need to store these as objects. So plot one, let's call our ggplot for data equals surveys complete and our aesthetics we want x equals species id and y equals weight and we want a box plot so we need to call the geom box plot and we want our labels x equals species y equals we actually want a subscript on our label. So we need to use this function called expression, which understands that anything in square brackets is a subscript. And we want the scale of the Y axis to be a log 10. And so our label will reflect that this is a long tail of weight. So let's go ahead and call, run this. And I get an error message. Data must be a data frame. That's because I had a typo. Did you accidentally pass a yes? Uh, hopefully that should fix the typo. Yep, it does. Great. Let's build our second plot, plot two, by calling our data yearly counts. Uh, ggplot expects the first argument to be data. So we don't have to specify that this argument is data because R will interpret it as a data. If you want to be explicit, you can name the argument data equals yearly counts, but you don't have to. 
And the aesthetics, x equals year, y equals n for count. And color, let's color by genus. And the geometry, this time we want a line. And we want to specify those labels using the LABS function x equals year and y equals abundance. So let's go ahead and run those commands. Plot 2. So now we have plot 1 and plot 2 stored in our environment. And with G, with the patchwork library, we can specify two stored plots, plot two plus a plot layout. So in this case, we want plot one on top of plot two, and maybe we want them at different heights. So we want plot one to be um, a height of three and plot two a height of two. Um, let's run this so you can visualize what this code is doing. So we're positioning plot one over plot two. And we've got the abundance in plot two. And we're specifying that we want plot one to be slightly taller than plot two. So it's a little bit easier to see when you zoom in on the entire plot. So you see how this is slightly larger, slightly taller than plot two. And it took us you know, a few lines of code to build a pretty complex plot. So once you have your plot built in this iterative ggplot approach, you often want to export your plots. If you were to export your plot using the export button inside the plot window pane, this exports it at a low resolution. So you wanna avoid using this export button. Instead, we can use a function called ggsave, which expects the first argument to be the file name. So here I've typed in uh, a name and the format as well. So here I'm saving it as a standard .jpg. It also takes additional arguments like the height equals, I'll call this eight, and maybe the, the width equals 10, or maybe Yeah, the width equals 10, and it needs units of these widths, so I'll give these inches. So this is 8 by 10 is a typical standard piece of paper. And it allows you to specify the DPI, which is the density of pixels per inches. And a lot of journals require a minimum of 300 DPI resolution. So I'm going to go ahead and save this. And navigate to my files and now I see that plot saved at a decent resolution and it's it's eight inches tall by ten inches wide so this would fit on a single piece of paper and I'll link to the other examples, other examples provided by Patchworks, you can see different possible plot arrangements. You can get really creative and add more than two plots. You could add four plots if they're really if they're small enough and explore with different options.
So I hope you find this valuable in thinking about the things that you want to graphically represent with your neon data. Have fun with it. Get creative. A link to different ggplot options for changing the colors and the fonts and all kinds of options to bring out your creativity when data when you're visualizing your data. So congratulations because you just completed this series of tutorial. Nice job.